have you made any thoughts about where you will be playing uh, next season? Has uh, anyone reached out to you, including from Mike Athens so far? Uh, no one from Ike has reached out to me. Um, uh, you know, I, I tell my agent, I mean, the way that we approach things now is just, you know, I tell him that, um, you know, once he gets three offers, bring me the three, the best that he has, and then uh, and then I decide from there. So, haven't got the three yet. Um, right now, I'm sitting at two. So, I'm waiting for that third one to come in. And once that third one comes in, then I'll uh, sit down and really decide. Is that the standard uh, operating procedure every summer? Uh, no, not, not standard, but uh, typically like recently here, the last, uh, before, right before, uh, actually, you know what, right before um, I came to Panathinaikos, um, that was kind of the way that uh, I was doing things. And uh, since Panathinaikos, the, uh, the decisions was made really easy. Like right after Panathinaikos, I, I knew I wanted to stay in Athens, so it was pretty much, um, you know, I kind of knew where things were heading uh, with Ike. And then after COVID hit and the season was shortened, I thought it was easier to come back to Ike. So I skipped a couple of years, but all the way up until right before Panathinaikos, that was typically the way that um, that I had did things mm -hmm. lead, leading up to that time. Leading up to what, that was 2018, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. 2017, 18, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, although it was a, could have been a conscious decision of yours, did you feel that to an extent you might have sacrificed some more titles on the altar, let's say, of your own basketball happiness or feeling more, co more comfortable by doing what you know best? Uh, well, I mean, I, I look at it like this. I, I probably sacrificed one or two more titles for, I mean, one or two more million dollars. So, I mean, honestly, that was, <laughs> and for, for me, that was a, um, a sacrifice that I, I was willing to make. And so, and to, to really be transparent about that is um, I, I all, once I learned about, you know, EuroLeague and, and the different teams and the structure of how Europe was structured, um, it, it didn't excite me to be able to go to the, the power, the six or seven powerhouse teams and go to the final four or win a championship with them because everybody does that. It's the same six to eight teams that are in the final four or win it every year. And so I felt like I could separate myself as the best if I could go to a team that had never been in those types of situations before and lead a team to that. So I wanted to push myself and see how good I possibly was. Like I wanted to do something similar to uh to something like, you know, Bo McCaleb and getting Bo McCaleb and uh, Vesely getting partisan to a final four or uh you know uh, um you know locomotive with you know Malcolm Delaney and Anthony Randolph and Chris Singleton and those guys making breaking through and getting to a final four to me that is I mean just in my opinion alone that is much more exceptional than you know Seska going to the final four eight years in a row or you know Madrid or Barcelona getting to the final four to me getting a locomotive or getting a Milan um, or getting a partisan to the final four was something that excited me. The challenge way much more. So if I could have did that at Kimki or Kazan or Milan, uh, some of the places I played, um, you know, that was what I was trying to do. Um, and also in fairness, you know, I also, and to be honest too, I, I got paid more money to go to the places I went to than what some of the bigger teams were offering. So to me, it, it was a win-win situation. That makes sense. Uh, how hard is it for an American player to accept and acknowledge and to adapt to the reality that he won't be able to make it in the NBA? Or if he does, his playing time and role will be limited and pursue a more lucrative and successful path by going overseas. And how did you come to terms with it? Right. So, uh, well, to answer the, the last part of your question first, I, I was lucky enough to have a mentor. Uh, by the time I made it to Russia, I was able to meet J.R. Holden and he, even though I had made it to uh, to EuroLeague before meeting him and it had got to, you know, in the point where I was making a, a lot of money, but he changed my mentality and my approach to what I was doing and the things I could accomplish and how to look at my career and things like that. So very, very uh, fortunate to have met him and had him help me and change my mentality. And so to answer the other part of your question, uh, 
You know, it, it's, it's difficult for Americans because, first of all, a lot of people don't understand. A lot of the guys don't understand what you're what you're capable of having in Europe. A lot of guys don't understand uh, how good the basketball is or how good the money can be or how good the lifestyle can be, depending on what country or city that you're in. Uh, we tend to in America, we tend to be a bit ignorant to, you know, what else is out there. And we think that what we have here, even though the NBA is the best league in the world, we look at not playing in the NBA or not making it here in America as a failure. So the mentality is all wrong from the beginning because we automatically fail. So that means we have to go overseas. And the entire time we're focused on trying to come back. Mm -hmm. So um, and my advice to guys is always that, you know, be two feet in wherever you are. So if, if you're in the state, stay two feet in here, try to make it stay here two or three years and, uh, you know, do everything you can. And if you don't make it, come to Europe and be all the way in, two feet in on the European side and, and create something uh, beautiful, you know, create, you know, your career and your own mark and your own path. So uh, the sooner guys from America stop looking at not playing in the NBA as a failure because there's only 450 jobs every year. I mean, that's, it's extremely hard to, to, to get one of those jobs every year. So as soon as you stop looking at it as a failure and looking at it as what you do have on the other side, I think guys would be in a much better position. Do you think that if you were like 10 years younger, you could be playing in the NBA right now? Oh, uh, yeah, actually, I mean, <clears throat> I think I could have played even um, at the time when, um, you know, when I was, uh, e even back then in the era when I was, but I had played myself into a position where, you know, my role and my salary and, and the things I was doing in Europe were had become so important to me. And I was so focused on it that, the NBA would have had to make an uh, offer that the NBA wouldn't, wasn't willing to make to, to get me to come back. So uh, at, at the point in time when I feel like I was really good enough to play in the NBA, my, my focus and my passion and my love was no longer the NBA. I was already on a different, I was chasing something else by, by that time. But mm -hmm. yeah, do I think that talent wise, was I capable? Absolutely. It's just, you know, uh, You know, my timing, the timing was off. That's all. Mm. Last April, you tipped your hat off to love reviews players. In general, have you noticed any differences in terms of mentality and mindset between the younger and older generations of Americans in Europe? I did. I mean, that's that's why I commended the guys from Live Rio because it was really the first set of young guys in Europe that I saw that had that same mentality as some of the guys from my era and a little bit older. It was the first group of guys. And I, you know, I give credit to the staff at Lario. They did a good job of um, putting those guys together on the team, but it was the first time that, that I'd seen that. So I was very, uh, very, very pleased to see it. And as far as uh, the mentality, of, I mean, I saw it in Daryl Macon, uh, one of my teammates from, uh, from this season. Mm -hmm. uh, he had, He had unbelievable uh, skill set and talent. And the one thing that I saw in him was that he was really willing to listen. And so he listened and he took in a lot of information. And now he's about to take a, a big step in his career, man. And, and I was too. about to ask you about him. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I'm I've been mentoring ahead, him throughout the, the past season. And what do you think of right. him about him joining Panathinaikos and transitioning to another level right now? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, Daryl has the chance to, uh, I mean, I said it. Uh, I don't remember after what game, but I said he's a budding star, a budding superstar, however you want to say it, in Europe. And if he he's made a big decision to, you know, let go of some of the NBA glitz and glams and, and really focus on basketball and create his own path. And, and, man, he has the ability and the talent to really do that. And I really hope that – obviously, the people at Panathinaikos seen that and they saw it up close because he played amazing um, in the playoffs. So – I just, I really hope that he takes uh, the next step and he's able to use his talent and ability the same way that he showed them that he deserved uh, an opportunity to play in your league. That's true. Uh, regarding your time in Panathinaikos, let's get back to this one. Uh, could things okay. have turned out better for you if you had spoken directly with Chavez Pascual in the first place? I mean, in October 2018, uh, we had a discussion where you told me that you had talked to one of his assistants and also to Dimitris Yanakopoulos, to the owner of the club, yeah. uh, but never uh, to Chavi on the phone, although there were messages passed back and forth between the right. two of you. Right. 
Uh, no, I mean, because, you know, in, in Europe, it, it works, it, it goes, it's about the club, then it's about the coach, then it's about the player. So, uh, I mean, no, uh, for European coaches, I, I don't think typically they they do call players and tell them exactly what they're doing or what they're trying to do. So, so no, but I, I, I do think two things could have happened. One, um, I mean, I, I do realize maybe I could have been a much more willing soldier I guess I could say, um, but it just was was very hard for me to to you know not know if I was going to play one game or play ten minutes in this game or play fourteen minutes in this game or maybe then play thirty minutes in the next game. Like for me, that was just it was it was it was very difficult. And while I did have some good moments, I never really could put it all together. So I could have been a little bit more understanding of that. Um, but as far as Chavi, you know, I don't have any complaints because even afterwards. We met. I saw him at a restaurant. I've said this plenty of times already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After I saw Charlie, and um, he told me that he he should have done things a little bit differently. So, and for me, that's you know that that meant a lot, and and I respect that because a lot of European coaches wouldn't do that. So I respect Charlie for that, and I was appreciative of it. Having played for him here for two years, uh, were you surprised mm -hmm. to learn the news of them being on the verge of uh, bankruptcy right now? <laughs> Honestly, no. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't surprised. And I think people that have played there, they would say the same thing. So uh, you know, I mean, but Kimki would be back. I mean, you know, it's a, uh it's just one of those things, man. I mean, it's Russia, it's um, you know, the money comes fast, the money goes fast. You know what I mean? So Kimki will be back and, and they'll build a team and in a, in a couple years, you know, down the line, nobody will even be talking about the fact that Kimki's not not playing this year. So I'm not surprised, but, you know, it's an interesting discussion point, I guess. How were things when you were with the team back then? I mean, they, they, they were fine. I mean, you know, a little bit up and down. I mean, sometimes, you know, you go three months without getting paid, and then sometimes they would pay you three months all at one time. I mean, you know, so it's just, you know, go through a lot of payments or, you know, I, anyway. Can didn't, you resemble Greece, that, didn't resemble Greece in any way? I mean. That a, style of... A, not getting paid on time. I mean, a little bit, but at the same time, you, you were guaranteed to get paid and you knew the money was there. And it was exponentially, <laughs> exponentially more money than what, uh, you know, typically they pay in Greece now. So, but from a standpoint of being late, yeah, it's a little bit similar. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Keith, uh, what do you think of the Euro League turning more and more into a closed league? Uh, is it a step to the right direction, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think I think they should. I, honestly, I think the the best the best direction for the Euro League to go is for those teams to play each other more than just a home and away. They should play at least three or four times, and those teams honestly shouldn't even be in the. I mean, okay, I, I won't say they shouldn't be in the domestic league, but the best thing for basketball is maybe to add a few more high level teams into the Euro League and then just play a schedule where you play everyone four times and just get the best basketball um, multiple nights a week. And then that's more sponsorships and more TV and more, you know, interest. And it, it just, sing, you know, gives the game singularity. And because uh, now I think there's too many moving parts in Europe. You got all these leagues with all these different cups and all these different, uh, you know, scheduling conflicts and all those things. So I think once they, you know, give the game more singularity and put it into one position and, I don't know, maybe put 20, 24 teams in a league or something like that and play a, a really big like schedule that a lot of people can get behind and understand some consistency i think it'll be huge for uh for european basketball a few weeks ago rick pitino told me that he feels that the nba will take over european basketball like they took over nba africa um okay. he added that the fans of Panathinaikos will be across from barcelona or real madrid would love it to have the nba connection uh, do uh -huh. you think that could be a viable solution uh, to the economic problems of European pro basketball at the highest level right now? Oh, it, it could be a solution, but at the same time, I don't think the, the powers that be want to give up that power. So, um, I mean, it's it's a, it's good in theory, but I don't think that, I think Europe has a little bit more resistance logistically and financially than Africa does to not let the NBA come in and take over the game. So I really don't see the NBA being able to come in and take over places like I mean, you know, the the Real Madrid's and the Barcelona's or the even the Russian, the Russian side, you know, like the Sesc. I mean, like mm -hmm. it's 
it doesn't seem feasible, but I mean, in theory, it does sound it sounds good. I guess. So. Over the last days, there's been much debate on FIBA rules on the occasion of Team USA's losses to Nigeria and Australia ahead of the Olympics. Uh, James White said uh, they're designed for less athletic teams to be able to catch up to NBA talent, while Jared Dudley of the Lakers suggested that the NBA should adopt some of those rules. What's your take on that? And what do you think of Team what USA's chances in the Olympics? So, I mean, really, I think that uh, Team USA <laughs> is a team that just got together, I mean, a couple of weeks ago. So, and, and they're still the, the best players in the world. So I really think that, uh, you know, for them, obviously the game in Europe has advanced. I mean, I'm not taking anything away from European players and the way the game has advanced around the world, but these are the best players in the world that just got together a couple of weeks ago. And some of them haven't participated in uh, international competition in, in years. So once they're able to make the adjustment and figure out the, the style, the officiating, uh, the different angles of spacing, you know, because there's less spacing in Europe than the NBA. Once they figure that out and get in the rhythm, I really feel like, uh, I mean, there's, there's, they're going to win the gold. I mean, not not easily, but it's 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 not. It won't be close. You represented the United States uh, team at the 2015 Pan American Games, if I'm not yes, mistaken. <laughs> Do you think that a U.S. squad, based on or including also Americans playing in Europe? would be a viable solution in order for them to not get lost in translation between different rules? Um, it, it would be, it would be, it would be competitive, but ultimately I do think that the, uh, the top European players, let's say, for example, uh, you take Spain and if they had like Paul Gasol, uh, like in, in his younger years, obviously, or if, mm. or if certain year, like if Doncic was playing for Slovenia, obviously there aren't any American players that are as good as, the, the best of the best European European players that are in America. So I still think I don't think that uh, America USA would be in an advantageous spot by using the high level European I mean, the high level Americans in Europe because they're still not as good as the best that Europe has to offer that plays in the NBA. Your Twitter profile reads, reality is wrong, dreams are for real. Um, which is the biggest basketball dream of yours that eventually did or didn't come true? And how do you feel about it? Okay, so, I, I, you know, I mean, it's, it, it does sound superficial, but, you know, I grew up, you know, extremely poor and in very difficult conditions. So my, my initial dream was honestly to, to, to be able to make money and to be able to make a living playing this game and to be a millionaire and things like that. Like I never grew up. I wasn't one of those kids that from age five or seven was saying that, Oh, I want to play in the NBA and Michael Jordan's my favorite player and all of those things. Like I really, you know, I wanted to play American football. I wanted to, um, you know, I didn't have an NBA dream, so to speak, but my love for basketball developed as I got older and I got better. And I really saw that this was a way, a way out for me. So once I got into high school and I started to get a little bit taller and I saw that I was a better player and I went to college. And once I got to college and saw the opportunities, you know, the love of basketball evolved for me. So um, my, my dream wasn't necessarily to be in the NBA, but it was to be successful and make money and be able to take care of myself and my family. So uh, like, that's when I say like my reality was you know, that you know, I, I really feel like I wasn't supposed to be here. Like, you know, the, the statistics and the way I grew up and the way my family was, it wasn't, that was my reality, but I, I, I chose not to accept it. Have you thought about life after basketball? I, I, I have, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's difficult because, uh, you know, I think that I've been doing this so long. I've pretty much been doing this every year since I was 15 years old. So now to be 37, and looking, you know, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's um, it's really, it's, it's difficult um, to think about the end, but I have thought about it. And the thing that I want the most at the end of my career is just acceptance. And when I, what I say by acceptance is just accepting, you know, the, accepting the career I've had, accepting the, the way that I leave the game. And, and if for me to be able to leave the game the way I want to leave the game, and that's without injuries, playing at a, a really good level, 
and having and knowing that I've given everything mentally and physically that I can. Like I'm, I'm going to leave the game when there is nothing else that I have in my body or my mind that I can give to basketball. You recently got your degree from Kansas, and congratulations on that. Um, Thank if, you, sir. If I'm not mistaken, journalism was your major in college. Yes, yes, sir, it was. Uh, so it if, you, if you were a journalist and uh, you could ask yourself one question only, and um, wow. which yes, would sir. it be and how would you answer it, actually? That's a good, that is a great question. So um, obviously I could come up with a better question if I had more time. But um, like just, you know, with, with uh, my knee jerk reaction to that um, would be, um, wow, give me one second to think about that. I, I, would, I would ask myself, um, Keith, why do you, hmm. no, 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 not that, not that. Uh, wow, this, you know what, man, I, uh, first I want to tell you this, man, this is the best question I think that I've ever been asked, seriously, from the Come time on. that Come I was, I'm, I'm, dead, I'm dead serious, because you put, because it forces the player to be, like, introspective, you know, and and, and think about, you know, uh, you know, himself in a way that he's probably never thought, so first of all, I, I appreciate you asking that question, and so I think that I would ask myself, um, you know, wow, man. Wow, that is a great question. Um, what would I ask myself? Keith Langford. What, um, so I would say, look, you have, um, you went undrafted. You um, didn't, you know, you played, a, you only played a few games in the NBA. You were cut, came to Europe. And I would ask myself, like, what, what would you be doing with your life and how would you be impacting others if basketball was never, um, if, if you were never able to learn and whoa, learn and be impacted by basketball the way that you have been, what would you be doing with your life? And the way I would answer that, um, wow, I don't, you know, it's, I, I would say that there's no way there's no way that I could have impacted the people around me and had the, had the life that I've had without this game, because I can only imagine being able to sit in here as a 37 year old man. I can only imagine talking to the guy that, that never was able to leave his neighborhood and go to college and talking to the guy that never w- was able to go live in Russia and Israel and Greece and Italy and, learn these different cultures and different languages and talk to these different peoples and understand the world in a different way. Um, I really think like this game has been a savior for me and without it, I don't, I, I can't say that, I can't say where my life would be. I'm afraid to look at where my life would be without basketball. And there was a point in time that I've, I've always been asked or like I've, it's always been implied that you should be something outside of basketball like basketball shouldn't be your identity or whatever and I'm like I want to say that like I think it's okay if basketball is your identity as long as you use it to impact the people around you and yourself in a positive way so for me um without basketball I don't think that I would have been able to impact the people that I've come in contact with in a positive way without it so I've I I am um yeah I'm I'm extremely fortunate uh, you know blessed all of those things. I don't necessarily like to say it like that, but I really am, and uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have it any other way. My, my journey. Did you actually learn all those languages? I mean, okay. Well, let, let me say I, I learned phrases and words. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I didn't learn the language, but I mean, I can. You know, I can get around a little bit. I'm, my best is a little bit of Russian and a little bit of Italian, mm. but other than that, like so. So yeah, but no, I didn't. I didn't learn the language. Just some words and phrases. That's all. Okay. I yeah. guess we have to sign off. Um, thank okay. you for your time. Thank you for your answers, for your sincerity, yeah. and for your okay um, availability. Most of all, well, of course. I and I, I appreciate. I appreciate you know your request. And man, I'm I'm sorry about the delay and a little the interruption. Don't yeah, worry so. about that. But thank you, man. This is great. I appreciate it. It's a drop it. in thank the you. ocean. Never mind about that. 
Oh, we'll be in touch, okay, Keith. Thanks. Best of luck uh, okay, great. in your future, and we'll be in touch, whatever happens. Okay. All right, awesome. Thank you, man. All right. If you post okay, it. Bye-bye.